I am now up to uh, up to bat, and he does not put the bunt on. But I'm like, well, you you bunt him over. I mean, that's what you do, right? I mean, this is the cardinal way. You bunt him over. <laughs> so I put game. the bunt. I foul it off, and he's like, and he like does the sign, no bunt. I bunt him again, get him over. Next guy um, drives him in. We walk off. I'm in the bathroom. And, you know, we celebrate him in the bathroom, like showering up, whatever. And I get pounded on the door. Like, I say, if you want to manage, you can effing manage. You can also drive your ass to Chattanooga on your own. Good luck. I'm like, what the, what just happened? We just won. <laughs> and he goes, you would not bunt if Larissa told you not to bunt. So why the F are you doing it here? Find a ride. Two thousand thirteen. I was uh, that was that was interesting. Pete phase. That was that was. Uh, yes. You met me at a strange time in my life. Maybe the best time. Probably though. the yeah. best time for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. As what, a teammate, probably sure, the yeah. best time. What it do was, you remember about Pete in twenty thirteen? Oh, great. <laughs> and this guy's lived like ten different lives. Yeah, yeah. What, ten what different lives. Yeah. yeah. For, uh, you know, like I always think about like um, clubhouses of like culture inflators or deflators, right? And this guy is a culture inflator. So there was no bad time when we entered a clubhouse because when you entered a clubhouse, right. this guy was like the life, right? We had Nick Punto and obviously Moylan, Mark Ellis. We had some like really good dudes. So when you walked in, you know, it was always, he had something teed up where he was going to, you're going to, you there's <laughs> you could not slip. This guy was going to be on top of you in a hurry. Right. So, but Very that true. was part of the, you know, that's what, how you win is you need guys like that around and yes. you were like the best. Do you think it. there's still an environment of because it was a very different time too it was it was it wasn't like it was with any kind of malice it was done with fun at heart all the time but you also kept guys in line a little bit more is that the policing that you see now as well well i, I mean we did it because we were friends and it was easy to get on each other right like you build a relationship first and then you could get on each other yeah. if you just are ta attacking each other and it's you have no feel then it doesn't work um but i i think it's just different nowadays when you know there's like so many different guys coming in and you don't have this core group coming up and then you mix in a couple of peter moylan's or nick puntos or that type of deal then it gets challenging of like you know can i get on this guy can i not um um, I think that's a little bit different. If you have so many different new faces all the time, it's just tough to build, you know, that camaraderie and then be able to get on guys. So my experience, man, like when I grew up, when I was growing up in St. Louis and, and even L.A., there was always that core. And then you could mix in these guys that just made this thing go. And you were one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. The times where it's you feel like you've seen it not done the right way is when guys, the older guys get on somebody and they just do it just to do it, maybe because it just happened to them. And it never happens, like you don't see it on the return. You don't see these guys, hey, come get dinner with me, come get lunch before the ballpark, before the bus with me. This is why I did this. When guys are messing with you, they like you. If a guy was, if an older guy with me when I was a rookie was quiet and didn't talk to me, I was like, oh, he hates me, I'm done. If they were messing with me, then I'm like, all right, they like it, they like me, this, this is good. So let's talk about culture because <laughs> Skip right here, he was my former coach, former teammate, you guys, family, same you family kind of, yeah, back parents, home, yeah, played dad, for yeah. each other's so grandfathers, crazy, right? that type of thing, <laughs> which is wild, we'll get yeah. into that. But you've seen it now from so many different seats. You were the young player, you were the veteran player, you were the front office guy when you stepped down, when you retired from playing, you were a first base coach, bench coach, and then now a manager. And what I love, and I was telling these guys, and I've said it to John Jay when we had him on here before, was you could have been a manager, in my opinion, a year or two before you actually became a manager. But in my opinion, you wanted to do it the right way and you had different roles. You went to a different organization because you wanted to see different cultures, how different organizations work. So how did you wait a couple of years to really want to be ready? And what is culture when someone says, hey, you got to go to this organization and build the culture and rebuild everything? Yeah, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do after I start, stopped playing. And I didn't understand really what culture was when I was playing. I just heard the Cardinal way, right? I was in the St. Louis Cardinal system for 12 years. 
you get drafted in a system, you get very fortunate, or it can go the other way, depending on who you're drafted or what organization you're drafted by. I was very lucky that I got to learn through a system, through these insane minor league coaches and coordinators, and got into playing with Tony La Russa and these incredible veteran uh, guys around me that really helped me. Um, when I left and got traded to you know different teams and then post-career, um, they asked me, people would ask me what the Cardinal way was. I didn't really have an answer for them because I had to think about exactly what I went through and why it was so successful. So going into San Diego, going back to St. Louis um, as a bench coach, I was like, all right, what if I was going to be a manager, what what would culture look like for me? And then what do I think the Cardinal way was for the answer? I don't think it's a bunch of sayings on a wall. Like that's the last thing I think culture is. Like you walk in and it's like whatever. I, I walk right through that, right? I see a couple pictures when I walk in, I'm trying to lock in on a game. You don't buy into that. No, and if someone asks you, a teammate or a player, what is culture or a coach, they're not going to just look at the wall and say like, that's the, that's what culture is. They're going to have to think about what the leader of the staff or the organization thinks about what culture is. So I try to make it really easy. I just said CAPE, C-A-P-E. And CAPE is communication, um, accountability or alignment, preparation and execution. And I thought about Cape because Albert Pujols, it felt like he always had the cape on because he had like over 100 stolen bases somehow. And every time he ran, he was just safe. So it felt like he had the cloak or the cape on. I was like, there's no way he was safe again. Like, no way. He went first to third again. I've seen him How? run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there's just no way. Out of respect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, so uh, you can't have alignment without communication. You can't have execution without preparation. So that's what I think it all it all is 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 it culture is you want to know as a player where you stand 100 percent as tough as it is to hear sometimes that you're not playing because x y and z at least i know where i stand right that's it at least tell me and i can figure out how to get better to change your mind uh, the alignment part is like if i'm not aligned with the gm it ain't gonna work if the clubhouse guy is not aligned with the other clubhouse guys or the traveling secretary, it's not going to work. If the manager is not aligned with the AAA coach or the coordinators, it's not going to work. So alignment is obviously huge. And obviously we know about the preparation execution of what guys, what you think preparation really looks like, um, whether it's, you know, the analytics, we can talk about that later or, you know, just the baseball feel. So that's what I really think it is. And then the other side of it is like the coaches that you have around you, I needed coaches to cover my blind spots. And so right away, do I think I could have managed a little bit earlier? I don't think so. Um, because everywhere I went, I learned something. And everything I know, I learned from somebody, right? I didn't just make this stuff up. But I did. I definitely needed coaches around me that you know, could hold me accountable, cover my blind spots. And the, the last thing is, like, I didn't want coaches to think that um, when they came in, it was just you know, it's just getting a paycheck or just getting on pension. Like the last thing I wanted to hear is just, this is just who they are as a player. Well, then why did I hire you? That's easy. <laughs> just, you just come in and you can just, you know, drink some coffee. Like I needed coaches to coach. And, um, and so I didn't know exactly the staff I wanted yet until maybe three or four years into coaching. I was like, okay, that guy's good. That guy's not good. I'll take that guy. That guy's a disruptor. This guy's a whatever. And then that's how I kind of formed the staff that I kind of wanted. Can you coach and drink coffee at the same time? Because Rob Rahas is on your staff. And we are. I love Rob. Absolutely. He's the best. Yeah, he's he the is. best. But you need guys like him, right? Yeah. I mean, he is, uh, he's got baseball feel, high IQ, game in game situation. There's as good as anybody um, and has been there, right? Has, has failed, has succeeded. Like, you need those guys around. Does that alignment carry over with a shift in the front office? Yeah, it's definitely been a, a work in a progress, right? Like, you know, I signed on and got hired by one regime, um, was, you know, and brought a staff over from different organizations and, um, you know, went on a nice, had a nice season last year. Obviously, there was turnover. Um, I wasn't, you know, the initially the, the pick of our new GM. Um, so there has to be some, you know, building of a new relationship all over again and um, in his new regime. And so far it's, it's been good. I mean, you, but it takes time. I mean, this That's is not an sure. overnight thing because you're meeting with the new GMs or the front office three times a day. 
right? Like it's a, either a phone call before the game or post game. Like you need to have, that's the most important relationship in an organization, in my opinion, is because if you guys have friction, heads up, right? So like whatever about a player or playing time or situations when they should be playing um, or different roles, I just think that like that, that, ha that takes time to build and it's, it's been so far so good. You said something interesting. When you're building a culture, what a lot of people don't realize, or maybe they do, but it's not talked about a lot, is the conflict that's involved. Very difficult conversations that you have to have with people. And you're dealing with very type A, per, type A personalities, highly competitive men who really, just tell me the truth, don't dance around it. What have you learned about communication and specifically communicating through conflict? First of all, big leaguers can see right through BS, right through you. It, I mean, if, if they can smell it at all, you lost them. And you can never get it back, by the way. Like once you lose a clubhouse, it's done. So you have to make sure that like you set a standard and then don't shy away from it. Um, and you can't shy away from tough conversation. It's just part of the deal. It's part of the seat. Um, but I, I feel like you have to give them um, always have to give them some honesty, but also some like positive feedback as well. My blind spot was I don't know Spanish. That's tough in this game, right? I'm, there's like 50% of my team is, is Latin. Um, so I needed to have a really strong Latin influence next to me. And I have that in pipe. Luis Ureta is my bench coach and obviously Rod. It's challenging when you give, you want a message to be sent to a um, Latin kid that doesn't really know English and make sure that he's not driving an agenda that you're not driving. So if he's trying to put his own spin on things and then going around your back and saying a different wow. message and not hearing what you, I want to be delivered, then we're going to have some trouble, right? And I think that that's why I'm very, very blessed to have Luis next to me because I know the communication is going to be there. He can spin it how he wants to spin it a little bit in the message, um, but it's the same type of message that we're trying to you know, make you better or the communication's got to be you know, just, just like I want it to be delivered. It doesn't sound like a spin. It sounds like more of a, just a, they translate in a way that's understandable. And I see it, it on a, a daily basis. I mean, it's just the relationship between the Spanish guys and the English guys. There's always been, for me, it's been a clubhouse guy, like a Martin Prado would be a bridge between the different cultures. And it was so important. And it was, and that role, I mean, I guess now you've got it with the coaches, but that role was just uh, invaluable. Yeah, it, no, no, it, it, you definitely have to have that, you know what I mean? James Shields, like he talked about when he first came over to Kansas City, he would go right to the back of the bus and he had his, you know, they called it uh, Latino Americano in the back of the bus. It was all Latin guys, they had a big speaker back there and Shields was back there like the life of the party. And he was like, listen, we need these guys on board with us. And it's not like they're any different, but when you're coming over to a new country and we've talked to some guys that go to Japan, you know, you don't feel like you're a part of the group right away. So how do you make them feel like they're a part of that group? And that's how you bring it over. And John Jay mentioned a story on here one time, and I'm pretty sure it was a World Series game or a playoff game. And he said there was one time that he was getting a start in center field and it was over you. I'm pretty sure it was a World Series game. But you came up to him after after the game the night before and said, hey, get ready to go tomorrow. You're starting. You're playing center field like we need you. Let's go immediately took any friction away of John Jay being like, oh man, is Skip going to be, you know, he's a veteran guy. Is he going to be upset with me? Is he going to look different at me? This is a World Series game. No, no, no. You go home, get ready to go. Boom. Pete and I were talking about it. It's like, yeah, when you're the veteran guy and there's the young guy that's kind of taking your spot, yeah, you want to go and say the right things. And you do, and you pride yourself on doing that. And that happened with me in Boston. Same time, and you I kind thought of about like you. this. You're like, yeah. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt, no <laughs> doubt. And I thought about you because it's like, man, like, I've had so many years in this game. I've had a great career. Why would I be that guy? And it was so genuine with you that John Jay was on your staff now with the Marlins. So if the players don't feel that, see that, yeah. then you know what I mean? But just talk about that moment because for me, that's what translates into the manager of the year, your first year as a manager. And that's where you know that your staff has your back because you've proven and showed to have theirs. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, this full circle thing. So John Mabry is my hitting coach. The first guy that picked me up my rookie, my rookie day, my, my open, I guess my um, debut was John Mabry. John Mabry in 2005, I'm 
left-handed hitter, utility player. John Mabry is a left-handed utility player. Well, whose job am I about to take or going to try to take? John Mabry, right? Who's the guy picking me up and taking me on a taxi to the field and giving me lunch or dinner dates with him, right? Like, he didn't have to do that. I, he knows that I'm about to take his job. I mean, it's an insane thought. It was like, of all people, it's not a pitcher, it's John Mabry. That's culture, right? And when you're pinch hitting for somebody and that guy comes off, you know, comes off, uh, you know, the, the on deck circle, is he pissed off or is he like top step, like, let's go? That's like real culture. That's John Mabry. So I learned real quick because in the minor leagues, you're not getting pinch hit for, you're not, you're trying to compete against the guy next to you, the fourth outfielder or the starting center fielder, in my opinion, uh, trying to get to the big leagues over this guy, right? I mean, it's just what it is. You're trying to win in the minor leagues, but you're also trying to get there over a lot of different guys. It's just the reality of the competition. So the fact that John Mabry picked me up, I was like, wait a minute, this is, now it's about winning. It's not Mm -hmm. about, you know, competition, it's still competition, but now it's about real winning. Fast forward five years, here comes John Jay, right? Left-handed outfielder, center fielder. I'm kind of utility player, player, second base, um, and then outfield. At the time, uh, in 2011, it was actually a little bit different. John Jay was the starting center fielder. And, and he was struggling a little bit um, at game f- about game three or game four. And so Tony brought me in and said, hey, listen, you're going to start in center field. Oh, it was the other way around. It was a little bit around, yeah. Ah. And so I went to John Jay and I said, hey, man, you know, I got you tomorrow, but you're going to be in there the next day. It's just a start. Like, just get ready, take a deep breath. And you could just see it be like, all right, we're good, right? And then he came in in like the seventh inning and you know took over center field and then i would play right and we'd kind of switch but it wasn't that like i was taking his job it was more of like hey take a breather you're still a huge part of this deal you're going to help us win and then game six like you know david freeze hit this crazy home run but it was all the other guys that john jay had an enormous hit that was two games later maybe got built him you know some confidence took a deep breath descalzo all these other guys that you know kind of um you know, unsung hero type of deal. But the point is, is like, I left, John Jay is now doing it to, you know, Kobe Rasmus or whoever. And then, you know, they leave it. That, that's how like a sustainable winning culture works. And that's why probably St. Louis has won for 17 straight yeah. seasons, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just what it is. For 30, th- 30 episodes in, I might've got a story mixed yeah. up. With <laughs> no, I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> Do you guys think the culture of youth sports, minor league baseball, do you think it's making it difficult to really focus on the team first mentality to be a good teammate? Is it playing any kind of role where, where there's so much more individualism and me, 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 that it's the stories like this are a little bit harder to come by because from an early age, they're not being taught to be focused on the team. Is, is that, are That's, you guys yes. That? And I, I want to do while we're, because we're transitioning now to the youth side, and I love this, but Kim Ng, was that a big reason why you took the job in Miami? Because, like you said, to rebuild an organization, because you guys took a team that was not very good to the playoffs that first year. We talk about you have to count on people. You have to count on your staff. You have to count on that relationship with your general manager. You have to count on people in the minor leagues developing players and coaching them the right way. So... To Sue's point, I was going to ask you that. Was that a big part? And how different is it in the minor leagues now? Because from the rookies to when I was a veteran guy in the big leagues, the stuff that they were talking about was way different. So I couldn't imagine what that's like in the minor leagues. And then eventually we're going to get to Brody in the youth side. But so so real quick, Kim, was she a big part of that? And how different is the minor leagues with all that stuff now? Uh, She was the reason why I went to Miami. I, I mean, I think... Well, first of all, it was my first big league job as a manager, right? So those don't just pop up. So you're in some interviews and you're, you know, in a in a room uh, filled with, you know, a bunch of assistant GMs and analytic guys, um, and they're trying to make a call on you and judge you. And you, you know you're not going to get the full um, support. It's not going to be like every single guy voted on you, right, to be the guy. But I know Kim rolled the dice and took a chance on me, right? Rookie manager, she has to win. It hasn't been, you know, real great in Miami as far as win-loss record. And her contract is coming up. So she has to take a shot on me, not really knowing that I've never managed before. Um, 
so yes, a hundred percent. Like I, she also let me, um, hire my own coaches. I don't believe in arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe in it, right? I just feel like we have to have the guys that I believe in next to me for this thing to work. And she was good with it. So we hired the the right guys around us. And yes, I was like, I'm so grateful for her that she t she rolled the dice and, and we had a great relationship. And I don't take the job if I don't have a good relationship with the GM. It just doesn't work. I just don't believe it works. We've seen it. It does not work. So, um, so yes, very, very fortunate um, that, that she rolled the dice uh, on that. As far as like the coaches in the minor leagues and coming up. This is, this is, we can be here forever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, comfortable. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I think if you paid coaches, Thank you'd you. get really good coaches in the minor leagues. The $50,000, $60,000 salary of 130 plus games, plus instructional league, plus extended spring training, plus the bus rides. It's just, it's unbelievable. And there, you're losing a lot of really good baseball guys to college or to facilities or to whatever, because it's just not worth it. Um, when I came up in my, double A, my, my manager was Mark Dijon. He was the bench coach for Tony La Russa for six years. That was my double A guy. The, my hitting coach was Steve Balboni. Bye bye Balboni, right? You know, Haas, like, <laughs> like 400 homer. Bye 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 Balboni, right? That was my double A staff. And so anything that we did was focused on would you do that for Tony La Russa in the big leagues? So I have a funny story. Like, double A, I make the mid season all star game, all star team. So I'm super pumped up. I don't have a car in double A. My wife is, my girlfriend at the time, my wife is with me and it's in Chattanooga. And at the time we're in the double A smoke is Smokies in double A, Tennessee Smokies. And it's like a couple hour drive. Mark Dijon, because we won the first half was the coach for the, the all-star team. So he's like, all right, Skip, you know, we'll drive up together. You'll bring your wife and, you know, be good. We'll get to Chattanooga. We'll play and then we'll drive back together. It's like, perfect, because I don't have a car. The day before we're, we leave, we're playing in a game. Uh, bottom of the ninth inning, leadoff guy gets on. I am now up to, uh, up to bat. And he does not put the bunt on. But I'm like, well, you, you bunt him over. I mean, that's what you do, right? I mean, this is the cardinal way. You bunt him over. <laughs> so I put game. the bunt, I foul it off, and he's like, and he like does the sign, no bunt. I bunt him again, get him over. Next guy um, drives him in. We walk off. I'm in the bathroom, and you know we celebrate. I'm in the bathroom, like showering up, whatever, doing other things, obviously, in the bathroom. And I get pounded on the door. Like, say, so if you want to manage... You can F and manage. You can also drive your ass to Chattanooga on your own. Good luck. I'm like, what the, f what just happened? <laughs> we just won. And he goes, you would not bunt if Larissa told you not to bunt. So why the F are you doing it here? Find a ride. I was like, what? <laughs> so I drive, obviously find a ride to Chattanooga with my wife. No um, he did not drive. <laughs> didn't even say anything to me at the all-star game. Uh, drive back and then we meet after and he's like listen I am trying to get you ready for the big leagues I like we're trying to win here too but my my goal is to get you and everybody else ready for the major leagues if Tony La Russa does not want you to bunt it's because there's a bullpen matchup that's coming in and he doesn't want that guy facing the guy behind him so he's walking me through the game situation never even crossed my mind that the bullpen he doesn't want the matchup behind him it just happened to work so then i started learning the game situations more because of mark Dijon. do i think that's happening up and down every minor league system absolutely not because when they get up to uh, the big leagues gotta develop gotta develop mm -hmm. and you never stop developing at the major league level i i, I believe in that but to me, it's a know-how league, not a figure-it-out league, right? And you ha you're you figuring it out in the minor leagues. you got to know what the situation is. If you're bunting, get him over, get him in, whatever it is. But that stuff is getting lost because there's a lot of, and no offense, but there's a lot of new coaches that don't know the style of the major league level unless you have a little bit of it filtered in in the minor leagues. Yeah, it was almost like a criteria. And the Cardinal way is who set the way in the minor leagues. Everybody knew the Cardinals like the way they played the game, it was fundamentally sound. They knew 
the base running thing, you see the base is loaded, one out, the guy's sprinting through second. That's a cardinal way. Did you have certain th rules too? I felt like every time I came to a game and there was runners on first and second and there was a coach's visit, you guys would double steal on me. I think it happened to me twice. <laughs> right Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Maybe you know, right. just thinking on me. You hit a double, you hit a double that pickoff's coming, the drop right. glove, cardinal way. These are the cardinal guys. Coaches that went on to different organizations, you're like, hey, this guy is the bench coach for the Dodgers. He's a Cardinal guy. You hit a double, watch out. It's just every attention to detail, the Cardinal way, mm. they just, they did that in the minor leagues. And how now with, with all the information, how do you go about, because even the young players now, that's how they talk. They need this information. So analytics, like I'm not a guy that's like, yeah, you need to you know, like analytics, you don't need it. You can't live and die by it, but you certainly need it to blend because you got to communicate with your players. You got to communicate even with some young coaches. So what's your take on that? And how do you, do you feel like you just need someone that can really translate the analytics to the player? And how do you present that to the player? Yeah, you can't cookie cut it. So you can't deliver all the information to every single player because some can't digest it, right? So there's some guys that can really understand the analytic part of it and go into the batter's box or go out in the field or a pitcher and, and understand the analytics. There's some guys that have no idea what anything means. You try to educate them, but maybe they're just super talented and they can't digest that and, and compete in the batter's box or and compete on the mound. So that you have to understand that it's a tool. And it's a really good tool, but you have to have coaches around to blend the baseball sense and baseball feel with the analytics. A lot of the analytics to me is the pregame work and pregame prep of like this. These are good pockets. This is a time where like his bat is really good against that pitcher coming in. It's a really good coaching tool that you can use. But then also you watch the game and you have to trust your eyes. So as far as the kids that are coming up, if you don't have the information, they're going to try to find it somewhere else. Right. And the last thing you want to do is have them go to these other facilities, even though they're good facilities like the treads or the driveline. They're fantastic for off season and getting better and stronger and all that other thing. But if you're not delivering the information that these guys are craving, then you're going to lose them. And then they don't trust you. They don't trust the organization. And the last thing that you want to do is um, have, you know, no offense to some organizations, but a team, a guy that goes to another organization and then oh, all you have to do is throw your four seam at the top and you're, you're a really good elite pitcher. Like, you know, Garrett Cole went to Houston, right? And it's just like, oh, just do this. And he's like the best pitcher ever, right? OPEC right now. Yeah, whatever, right? Whoever yeah. it is. Um, and, and I think that is like, you don't want that as an organization. So you try to like make sure that you are no stone unturned, right? Every single player dive in analytics is huge for that and if we miss then that's on ultimately the coaches because we want all the information to give it to the player to make them the best version of themselves if they go somewhere else then we miss and that's a huge failure so i think the analytics really help um, in that sense but man like in the box if you're thinking about like the analytics stuff heads up it's compete mode right you talk about it's the jungle right the, jungle. the last thing <laughs> you want to think that. about is like you know 22.2 inches of like you got to be like it's me against you and if you don't then you're you're in trouble yeah if you're thinking in that box you're going to shake your head and realize it's o2 and i better start <laughs> competing in there so now the hard hitting stuff now so how <laughs> Brody, Brody, your son, which is crazy to me, is now committed to TCU because I remember Brody when he was a little dude, always with that clean lefty stroke and your daughter Presley, which that's the most bad ever, <laughs> by the way. Um, but with Brody, Brody is now coming up in a time where he's one of those kids now where that is what they they see. They see the information. They're getting judged off the information. They're getting From graded out at these showcases individually, not really if they won the tournament, how did they do individually? They get their scores and all that. So how do you mix that? How do you blend that with Brody? Because him and his teammates are seeing one thing and they're chasing one thing, but deep down, you know, like, all right, I need you with the fundamentals of the game or thinking a different way. So how do you go about all that? So early on, I just believe in fundamentals. That's like every travel ball system that you're in, it should not be about wins and losses. It should be like, are you training the kids the right way to become really good high school players 
at eight, nine, 10 years old. Like that's the goal. It's not to win the PG tournaments or whatever. Who cares about the nine year old like ring or trophy? Like I don't under, I never understood that. So are you, de- are you in a program that's developing the right way? That is like, that was my number one goal. I was very lucky to find Saddleback Cowboys back home who was high school coaches were the ones that were um, teaching the game the right way. Uh, the mental side and the physical side um, didn't really care about the wins and losses. Fast forward now to the showcase era. Brody, um, and we'll talk about, you know, the TCU and that stuff a little bit later, but he had a really good year, won the MVP of this, you know, really good league uh, back home, did not make um, the Airy Code team. Um, And Airy Codes is a big tournament that is now Long Beach State. Wait a minute. Okay, yeah, there you go. Um, And what those showcases sometimes are, are exit velo, uh, MVP, and then how f- how fast are you throwing it across the diamond, crow hopping ten times from <laughs> from shortstop, yeah. right? Yeah. And then like it just looks like you're kind of u- the unicorn chaser. Like that's what they want. They just want to find this unicorn, and that's it. And we're gonna put a bunch of unicorns out there, and then go ahead and play. The problem is, is you're missing a lot of baseball, like real baseball players. Brody is a baseball player, right? He's, he's on a team. He's going to help you win games. He's going to field the ball fundamentally sound. He's going to hit. He's going to run. He's going to do. He's a baseball player. He's like, you know, the the Brendan Donovans, the Descalzos, like the the guys that you need on your team to help you win baseball games. That's what. So I think a lot of these showcases uh, or these teams are missing on really good baseball players, and um, and they're unicorn chasing instead of like whoa, that's a good player that's going to help me win. So he ended up making the team after because some kid got hurt and did really well. Um, But it was a good learning lesson for him too because he's like, well, do I go on the team now? I mean, they didn't want me before. Do I go now? I'm like, yeah, now it's your opportunity, right? So show them what they missed. Prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a really good thing that he didn't make it. Um, And then he got humbled a little bit and then showed that like, yeah, I deserve to be here. So that part was good. But yeah, you if you're not in a program where like they are teaching like the game the right way, then by the time you get to our level, we have to teach the game at 21 years old, which is or 18 when you're out of high school, which is just so crazy to me. So it's the showcase uh, era. It's not team. It is guys are flying in from every city and state to play on one team. They play for three games and they leave. There's no way you can develop um, chemistry or culture or learn what a team situation is. They're not teaching. They're just showcasing. So you're not getting a guy over. You're not pitching. You're not learning how to pitch. You know, all these game situations that we talked about. Are yeah. there places where you can where you can find that type of baseball? Or is it just every single travel ball seems to be the same right now and it's all focused on the numbers and that's it? Um, I, I think there are there there are a lot of really good programs out there that are run by good you know ex former players or uh, former or former coaches or current coaches. I think when it gets to a pay for play situation, then then you're in trouble, right? And so you know you're getting all these offers to go play in certain states or or um, or cities, and you know it's just it you realize it's just a pay for play situation, so you're not learning the game. And they're trying to drive up their wins and losses which then drives more people to them because thinking that that's going to make their kids better because look how many times they went it's it's how do they fix it and it's it's fomo for parents Mm -hmm. right too so like if if you don't go in this situation if you don't go to this tournament then duke and tcu and oregon are not going to see you it's like that's not true (laughs) <laughs> like their job is to find the best players no matter where you're at. You don't have to go to fly to Georgia or whatever to play in one tournament. It's just it's they're selling you on on a product that uh, for me, you don't have to do because it's expensive, man. Like the flights, the hotels, the cars, like all that. There's a lot of p- families that can't afford it, but they're just as good a player. Yeah. And the really good teams will find you anyways. As I'm seeing you, hearing you describe all of this, I'm thinking about Brody and, and one of the competitive advantages that he has is he has a father who has played at the highest level and is managing at the highest level. And there are a lot of parents, there's a lot of parents who watch this, who have kids in, in travel ball. What advice do you have for those parents? Knowing what you know, you're at the peak right now, coaching and managing, managing at the highest level. What advice do you have for these parents uh, that can help them parent their kids as they navigate youth baseball? Um, <laughs> there's a few things. Uh, 
So I think that um, you have to be their biggest fan, number one. Um, I remember, you know, the car rides were so special to me and my wife, like driving home after the game. There's other families that their kid didn't want to sit in the car, you know, on the way home um, because they would just be like, you know, told what to do, what you didn't do and how you got to get better. You suck, whatever it is. It's like, dude, did you play? Because you I don't you think you sucked, too. So, like, why would you <laughs> beret your, your kid? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So, like, the car ride to the field and the car ride back home was always super special to me. And I never wanted them to think that, like, I was judging them. And uh, I didn't want them to think that I was, you know, mad at them for a, a play in the game that maybe, you know, didn't go their way. Um, and I wanted them to, to understand that I was their biggest fan no matter what. So the drive home, we always got something to eat, got ice cream, whatever it was. Um, and I always felt like that was the way to go. Um, so being their biggest fan, being their biggest encourager, the drive home is a, is a huge deal because that's when, you know, the, you, the kid can go one way or the other, right? Uh, mentally. Um, and then the other thing is like my, my kids had to play two sports until eighth grade. COVID kind of messed it up, but Brody played three baseball, basketball, football. Uh, and then my daughter, my daughter played basketball and, um, soccer. She's a soccer player now only. And then she was going to probably run track. But I always felt like every sport affected every sport. And the year round thing is good. You can mix in some games if you wanted to. But I, I really feel like, you know, getting a break and playing other sports was was really beneficial in their growth. That's awesome. Physically and mentally, right? Just For to sure. give like Brody, if he's just locking in on a swing and something happens, he doesn't feel right. Now it's football season. Let's go to football and do that for three, four months or whatever long, however long that is and get back to baseball and, and lock in that way. I think a big thing too, that a lot of the youth parents don't realize, especially for some of these kids, a lot of these kids that are expected to get drafted in the high rounds or, or even committed to a good college is too much exposure. Isn't the way to go when you are showing. And, and it's not so much like going to a tournament, playing the games, competing, Going to a showcase or even talking to scouts and telling them everything about you and continuing to meet with them, there is some bad stuff that can come from that because Scott Boris used to always tell me, he's like, this is like you, you are their book. Make them pay to read your book. You don't want to just be an open book and let them know everything about you because at the end of the day, when it comes down to negotiations, they can use a lot of that stuff against you. Hey, you told me you don't feel too confident in these situations. They will bring that to the table against you and and say that. So to take it a step further on the youth side, a lot of the information, the data is stuff now when you go to these showcases that some of the teams, some of these coaches, scouts from colleges are, are acquiring. And I don't really know how to fully explain that. So how can you explain that to a youth parent? What does that mean if a, a team has my son's data? Is it they can know, they know when he's gonna, or he's injury prone or like what specifically are they acquiring when they're acquiring your data? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of ways you can spin this thing because sometimes you get overexposed, like you're saying. Um, some got, sometimes, uh, you know, agents are now all in on high school kids at 15, 16 years old, telling them don't play in high school, just wait for the summer um, so you can get stronger and we want to showcase your stuff. Um, sometimes, you know, if you are now pulling the shoot in high school, well, that's a bad thing. Because now you have something on your um, your resume saying, well, he missed his sophomore year because of a shoulder. What happened there? Uh, well, it's my agent that said, you know, I should play in the showcase. Well, is it or like, you know, is it really a shoulder thing? So sometimes you have to be careful with some of these advisors as well. Um, luckily, you know, Boris is one of the best, if not the best out there. So he has an idea of how this thing should work. Um, but I do feel like, you know, Teams want to see you play against the best competition. So that is real before you get drafted, right? Like they want to, you should know as a scout, you should know everything about the player before you draft them. You should know their character, their family situation. Do they love the game? Do they just do it for a hobby? Like all of that stuff is also real. So, but it, it, so it's just a fine line of like, uh, I want to be against the best competition as a player before I get drafted. However, um, if you get exposed too much or 
the advisor is giving you bad information, heads up as well. And that is what is the most eye-opening for me now that Brody's in high school is, you know, there's a couple guys that don't play high school baseball, which to me, because all the showcase stuff, that is where culture and chemistry and all that team uh, is in high school. I loved high school baseball. Yeah. I still think it's great for you. Um, but I also think that like, when advisors are telling you to do something else and stay away from high school, don't play high school baseball, just like soccer. There's a lot of girls that don't play high school soccer now, which blows my mind. Um, it's just travel. Then you got to be careful on who's giving you the advice. And then are you, are you taking advice from the right people? Because, you know, I don't, I'm just very guarded in general and I don't take advice from people that I wouldn't have dinner with. So mm -hmm. I'm just making sure that like these parents, I'm trying to educate them as much as I can of like, make sure that you're doing it the right way. I just feel like everybody's focused on the fact that this has become a business. It's, it's yeah. from every level at every age where we've lost the fun aspect of it. And it's all about, we want this nine year old to be a big leaguer at 19 or 21 or 23. And how are we going to do that? It's just, you're missing out on 10, 15 years of these guys' lives focused on the wrong sh Yeah, no, it's, I mean, even the kids, I mean, how can you not think of it as an individual or as a business of, am I going to sign for this? Or am I going to get NIL money? Or am I going to go to this college? Because they're surrounded by it. So there's really no way around it. But at the end of the day, you focusing on it from the age of six to 15, sure, it may help you get motivated and you can see the end or you can see the light. But that much focus has to be detrimental at that age instead of just letting it happen. And there's more than one way for it to happen. There's not just a bookmark or a blueprint. You've, you've got to have different stories. You've got to have different ways. You've got to have different ways to get there. I just, I just I, I'm actually curious. Exactly. And I'm actually curious on what you said. So if I'm a parent, I'm listening to this and I hear you say, OK, be careful who you get your advice from. How do you know? What are signs that someone is giving you high signal advice with good advice versus bad advice and misinformation? I mean, even as, as a player yourself, like you, you have people who want to put their fingerprints on you and they want to, hey, do this and this is going to be good for your career. This is going to lead to this. And when you're a young person and you want to make money or you want to put your child in a good position, how do you know what's good advice and what's not? Because you have a lot of smooth talking snake oil salesmen yeah. coming in and it sounds good, but it might be terrible. What what advice do you guys have on how do you know what's good advice or what's I got, not? I got lucky, man. I like you said, I found Scott when I was sixteen. So mm. I don't I don't know if you have a I got a tons of situation. failed failed attempts and lots of lessons <laughs> to go back on uh, myself. So that I mean, as far as I just ask me a question, is the is the short answer to everything? I, it's, it's hard for me to to even try to. It's taken a lifetime of me fucking up basically to figure out who I am, what I want to be, and the lessons that I want to teach. So, and listen to you speak, it's it's the genuine people, the more genuine people that you have in your life, like a Skip Shoemaker, the better off you're going to be. There are snake oil salesmen or emu oil salesmen everywhere. And it was when I came up too, it was either about give us a tip on this or find us this, or it's they're everywhere. You have to find the trust. You said trust so early on, that stuck with me, communication. It is so big to communicate. I, I, I don't and I didn't still for the longest time communicate with people in the right way. I would push things away and push it away and just try to forget about it. You've got to get it out and open. Honesty is the best thing for not just baseball players, but humans. Be honest with people, don't bullshit them, and it's the easiest way to get to the truth and the trust. I think, I think the um, as far as like the agent and the snake oil and all that stuff, people getting advice from the wrong people, the dangerous part is there's parents now that just want to put on the jacket. Like I got an agent, my son's got an agent, my son's going to, you know, South Carolina, my son, whatever it is. Right. And, you know, are so they are so excited to be that in their community where it doesn't like you're taking advice for the for, again from the wrong people. So why not find out other people that have been through this before and they can give you a real good take instead of just saying yes to the first agent, yes to the first school or whatever it is. Um, I think it's it's a big learning lesson. Like when Brody was going through um, his 
college recruiting in ninth grade, which is insane, right? Uh, braces, didn't shave yet, uh, I, trying to go figure out if that was the right dorm or not. It's like, what, <laughs> what are we doing? Um, but, you know, when you're when he's talking to these coaches um, and I'm listening with him on the drive to school of him talking, because I'm not driving it, he's talking. This is before the rule change, right? Um, that they could talk to eighth graders and ninth graders. If those coaches were... Um, talking crap on the other schools, you knew that wasn't the school for him. Right away, judge a character, done, you're out for me. Um, if they were just selling their product and what they can do for Brody and they cared about the family and all that stuff, then that's communication, then you can start trusting them and then you can start building that relationship. But if the first couple conversations are, oh, well, you know, they can't, they don't know what they're doing hitting, look at their numbers, they have no idea how to develop, look at what they, then I'm, I'm out. Yeah. And so, but parents will say, well, what'd you offer? Oh yeah, I'm in. It, do, it doesn't matter. And so that's why you see all these decommits and everything because, you know, the parent, it's a parent issue. It's not the kid. It's the parent issue that they are supposed to be protecting the player or your son or daughter and they don't care. They just, they'd rather put on the jacket to show off to their, their community or their friends. Yeah. Turtle Thomas was a longtime college coach down in LSU, Miami. I mean, he was everywhere, right? This guy, one year he got a, a rental car to go and, and recruit during the summer and he put like 60, 70,000 miles on this rental car. Like this guy's savage, he's a recruiter, he's all over the place, but he recruited me to go to Arizona State and during the recruitment, he got the head job at FIU. So as I'm talking to him on the phone, he's selling Arizona State, telling me how good everything about it is. Then he gets the FIU job, so he calls me and he goes, listen, Everything I told you about Arizona State, I still stand by it. That place is amazing. If you want to leave home, go there. I still fully endorse that place. Like, unbelievable. You'll become a great player out there, great person, all that. But if you want to stay home, I just took the FIU job. So to me, I'm like, man, this is cool shit. Like, I feel like I can reach back out to that guy at some point and I'll get some genuine advice. So that to me, and I still remember that. I was 16, 17 years old or whatnot, but that stuck with me as well. Um, yeah, I think that people who are really good at giving advice, for me at least, they're, they're not people who just tell you what to do, but they tell you what to consider. And I, because they don't know my situation, they say, it's like, okay, you need to consider, you need to consider this, and you need to consider this, you consider this. And anyone who is emphatic about the future, oh, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, I immediately, right. my walls go up. I'm like, yeah. you, can, you don't know that for sure. You're coming off like you're giving me this high probability number that you don't know for sure. And so I think, I think when we're getting advice, it's really important. So it happens when you go, when I go to the doctor's appointments and when they're talking about things that I have no idea what they're talking about, I want to find out this person's circle of competence. I want to see how, okay, how, how wide, how deep can this person go and how much can I push on them? And so there are moments where I'm listening to somebody and I don't know what they're saying and they could be, and then I'll say, okay, what would a, you're telling me to do, what would another doctor tell me to do? Is there another doctor who would disagree with you? Immediately they'd be like, maybe, what, what, what would that doctor tell me? Oh, they'd probably tell you to do this. I'm like, okay, good. That now we're, we're loosening you up a little <laughs> bit. So to give me real, be much better information instead of you shoving me down a path that, that might not be best for us. But I, I, love, I love this. this that way part. of thinking is so, I could have used that from age 15 <laughs> to about 15 minutes ago, but it makes so much sense. You've just, it's all the, it's the sales pitch. You've got to listen to it, ingest it, and think about it, don't just buy everything that's thrown at you because they're gonna be trying to sell you on the future, the possibilities, but it's not a guarantee, no way. We gotta, we gotta talk about Cade, <laughs> Super Cade, which is crazy because I just saw one of the Instagram pictures just posted and he looks like a grown man right now, it's, it's wild. But Cade and you have had a relationship for a lot of years now and I know even when you were assistant coach, you always brought him in to tell his story, so I know you wanna give him yeah. a shout Yeah, no, I appreciate you bringing up Cade. Um, you know, I, I dealt with anxiety as a player um, and I didn't really know how to navigate it early on in my career because there was no mental skills, health professional around the game, um, especially um, team to team. You just didn't have one. The last thing I was going to tell Tony La Russa is, like, hey, man, I'm not feeling great right now, right? Like, there's no way. Like, you just 
tuck it inside and you try to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So I needed to find, um, you know, something to do to get my, um, put things in perspective and get outside of the game to figure this thing out. Um, so in 2009, uh, we acquired Matt Holiday and Adam Wainwright and we would do hospital visits and it just got me away from, you know, the game itself and just put everything of like, all right, baseball is not that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world if I don't succeed or if I don't catch the ground ball, if I don't get the big hit, there's other things that are much more important than, than um, you know, the game you know, Tuesday night against the Pirates. So I needed to do that and they really helped me with that. So I get traded in 2013 and my wife uh, to the Dodgers and my wife um, is like, we need to be part of something bigger than, than ourselves. Something in our, our community we gotta dive in on. You know, what do you wanna do? I was like, oh, you know, we'll just, you know, do some hospital visits, figure this thing out. Well, there was a little girl who passed away in our community named Jesse Reese from brain cancer. Um, her chemo buddy um, uh, was, or is, uh, was, uh, Cade Spinello, who is now super Cade. So I got to dive into this, um, really incredible organization called the Jesse Reese foundation. Um, she passed away, uh, in, uh, 2013 and met Cade, brought Cade down, um, and started creating this like Nigu never, ever give up, um, baseball camp. So Cade would come around and we'd have all these kids that were my son's age. Um, now, not only about like the fundamentals in the camp, but it was, I would bring these kids that were fighting cancer in each group with our kids to show like, hey, listen, like there's other things besides baseball that are more important in the world. So it was a really good camp and I, I still do it. We're like, 10 years in now, it's, it's been awesome. But Cade now speaks to every single team I've been on and he's been an inspiration. I have a tattoo, Nigu, because of him. Um, he's gonna be graduating high school, which is insane. Um, and I, I just can't believe you know the growth, but what he's done for me is like, I thought I was doing really cool things for these kids, you know, uh, you know, fighting, you know, whatever illness they were like fighting for their lives. And what I got back was they were doing more for me than I was doing for them. And so now I try to bring, now we still do this, the, um, uh, we, Jesse Reese created this thing called joy jars that she handed out to every single kid in, in, uh, that was dealing with cancer or fighting cancer. And her middle name is joy. And so we still do that. I still bring guys, um, with the Marlins to these hospital visits and hand out just to put things in perspective. But Kate and his family have changed our lives um, for the good, special human, you've met him. Um, and uh, just super grateful that he's in my life because it, it changed my whole perspective on on what baseball and life really is. You actually yeah. just you actually just said Kate is doing more and the, the, all the other kids, all kids, the kids are doing more for you than you feel you're doing for them. What are they doing for you? The kids, um, again, like the, when I go and I sit down with them and they're sharing their stories and they're sharing, you know, what they've been through and, um, you know, what their day look like, man, like that old for four, <laughs> that, that means nothing. You know, they just went through hell, honestly, and they have a smile on their face and they have a, a, a jar that opening up and have like, you know, 15 toys, which is amazing to play with. And I'm worried about you know, whoever I'm facing the next day or that night, like it is nothing in comparison. And then I'm super, then I become way more grateful for my family and the health of my family and everything, because I, you take that for granted all the time. Um, and when you have kids that are that age in my house that are healthy, and then you're going to the hospital with kids that are fighting for their life, man, it, it, it does something to you. And, uh, and just so I'm, I'm grateful to be part of a really good organization because Jesse was about the care and not the cure. So they were all about care of these kids and, and um, you know, they want to be out of business one day, right? That, that means it's over. Um, and so, and hopefully it, it happens one day. Yeah. You talk about perspective. Cade would always come talk to the teams in spring training. He would LA, he would stop by the clubhouses sometimes. And, you know, I had some, a couple years in San Diego, I wasn't performing the way I wanted to perform. And I mean, you talk about when Cade, you'd walk in the locker room and see him there, it was a breath of fresh air. You would like, the season, everything's happening so fast. It's day to day, it's boom, 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 on to the next. He would just kind of slow everything down, talk to him for 30, 45 minutes. And 
again, like I said, he was an absolute, is an absolute breath of fresh air. And I mean, to see his growth, to see what, and I remember one time in San Diego, he would talk to the team and then he would hang out in spring training. He would hang out after during the practice. And I was talking to him after ground balls one time. And he's just like, man, he's like, Aaron Judge, man, did you know Aaron Judge was adopted? He goes, man, that had to have been so hard for him, his upbringing. And I'm like, I'm just looking at him. I'm like, dude, you're amazing, man. And I get goosebumps thinking about it right now. But little conversations like that with him just literally slowed down time. And he's someone I always check up on. And like I was just saying, I'm looking at his pictures now. I think you guys were just in L.A. with yep. the Marlins. Yep. I'm like, he's a grown man now. Grown man, so cool. Because of Cade, that Nigu bracelet, you see Patrick Mahomes wear it. You see Josh Allen wear it. A lot of big quarterbacks. Yeah. Um, there's been on the cover of Sports Illustrated six or seven times. Um, so what they've done, and, and because of Jesse and Cade, it's just kind of taken off. And um, you're right. I mean, it, it goes back to the parents too, right? They raised him the right way. And they um, there was no shortcuts even with Cade, even though everything he was going through, man, they just kept pushing, like, you're on your own, you're doing this, for, you know, X, Y, and Z. They put him in sports, put him in baseball, in basketball, in football, um, and he's doing these combines with these crazy quarterbacks. But just shows you the parents were, you know, did a, an amazing job of raising this kid. Too. Can I ask one more question? We've had... The parents' advice for baseball, specific parents. Give me some advice as just a parent. How to be, how do you be the best dad you can be? Oof. I, uh, the deep right here, yeah, digging deep. deep. I mean, this is what it is, right? Um, first of all, I believe in uh, dating my wife. So I, I don't think that ever stops. And I think that it's super impactful for my kids to see that um, and how much I really do love her and she loves me. And then we get through our issues, um, you know, whatever they are um, in a really professional manner. Yeah. But I do believe that like the, your kids are directly impacted by how your, it, your relationship is inside that, the house. Um, I was grateful to, you know, be raised by an incredible family. My wife was as well, but I do believe that them, see, they, they see way more than you think. For sure. Right. And I think that number one is, um, I think that that never stops of making her the most important part of my life. Um, and then they see that I think is, is super beneficial. And then I also think that like, I've there, I have three rules in my house. <laughs> so, or three sayings, one, there's no magic pill, right? Like you want something, you got to go get it. And I don't believe if I didn't show them that, or my wife doesn't show her, um, you know, how strong she is in her faith and how prepared she is to deliver a message when like, they're not going through something, uh, that they want to go through or whatever it is. I think that that is super powerful. Um, putting a surfboard on my car wasn't ideal after my re my retirement, like being a part of something and showing them like hard work, you know, you get a house and a car and all that stuff. So like, there's no magic pill. This thing just didn't just happen. Like there's, there's something to this thing, right? Um, never trust a fart. That's another one, you know? Yeah. That's a big deal for my kids when they're in school. Yeah. So remember that I one, that. <laughs> you like that one, never trust a fart. Uh, Been so, there. Hey, you never yeah. know. Right. Yeah. So I didn't want them yeah. to be embarrassed in school. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, and the other one, I, I really can't say, I guess I could, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I'm still in a position where I, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's, uh, but I do believe in like that, that relationship with your wife is mm -hmm. if you, if you have, one now there's divorce and that type of sure. thing but respecting the other side is gigantic i i'd I have one more i have <laughs> one more you you said you were talking about what got you initially into going and seeing and and supporting uh, um uh kate and so forth how it started with the the bouts of anxiety as a player one thing that i have learned in working doing advisory work with major league managers nfl head coaches tennis coaches, golf coaches, NBA coaches, just the, the head coach and the manager that's not talked about as a lot is number one, how lonely it is. They can't share things with people that they want to share. It, it's so heavy. And I want to speak for you. This is just what they've been telling me. Yeah. And then number two is there is a lot of anxiety and pressure and stress. And they're like, where do I go? And it's, they're not relatable. Like you can't, oh, woe is me, like lead the team. Like no one cares about your feelings. 
My question is, my question is, do you, how, how do you navigate all of that stuff now as a manager of a major league baseball team? Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's not a, uh, I definitely don't have this thing figured out. I think, you know, last year was a really good learning lesson. This year has been a you know, really good learning lesson as well. Um, the anxiety for me is, uh, is, you know, am I giving everything I can and impacting and our coaches and not micromanaging them, um, letting them do their job? Am I doing my part in that and like still encouraging them to keep going? Um, the anxiety for me is, you know, when you're, you know, not having the record that you have, that you wanted to have, um, are they checked out, which they're not, um, are they finger pointing, which they're not. Um, and then, you know, they, they they have jobs, right? These, this is their job. And then when you are not winning, um, the reality of this game is like, they look elsewhere to fill your position. And I want them to coach so hard that you're not replaceable. So that is a big deal for me. Like I want, like I coach so hard and there's a, things that you don't see too, right? Like text messages or coffees or drink after the game that like maybe the front office doesn't always see. That's coaching too. A lot of it's organic on the bird or whatever, right? Like that, that part of it is real. And it's not just like, you know, put a ball in a red machine and feel it. Like there's way more things that are um, involved in, in real good coaching. And so am I missing anything is like, that's the real anxiety. And to, to, to answer your question, like I lean on my wife and I lean on a couple of the, the bench, co uh, bench coach that I had or my coaching staff that have been through it or I'll reach out to players. I mean, it's just like, what am I missing? You know, like, what are you seeing from the other side? And I'm totally okay with, having a tough conversation about myself too, because I want to get it right. You know, it's not just about the wins and losses. I know that's what we're judged on, but the anxiety is real for the other stuff that I just mentioned, because I care so much about the players. I want them to be big leaguers for a long time. And I want my coaches to be the, on a coaching staff with us for a really long time. And I don't want them to be looked any other way. Point. There's a, that, my last question too right now since you guys are all doing this <laughs> but uh miami i mean i know you guys are all there at different times but you spolstra mcdaniel pat riley obviously still with the heat i mean there was a strong manager head coach uh community down there in miami you ever get to reach out or get to catch up with any of those guys yeah so i'm a gigantic eric spolstra fan oh, obviously man. mcdaniel that you know pat riley the whole deal but spolstra has been on like to be in how many different rosters has he had? How many getting into NBA championship after NBA championship game series? Um, 17 or 18 years now in one organization is unheard of and constantly winning. So I had to figure out a way to meet him. And uh, so he uh, came into L.A. last year. I live in uh, Orange County, California. Um, so we drove up. I had our PR department like set something up before the game and a shoot around. And I just had to like dive in. And he was super gracious um, to invite me in. Talked with him and Brody. Brody was there Sick. and just picked his brain on a number of different things because like heat culture is what it's all about, right? Like they've had superstars. They haven't had superstars. They've had not huge free agents and they've had these guys come up through the system that have become superstars. So how is it that you keep doing the same thing over and over again uh, as far as winning, but you have different rosters, different personalities, the whole deal. Um, I was super intrigued and I wanted to dive in. And um, so he allowed that uh, to happen during right before a game of all things um and uh very grateful for it i still you know we i don't i wish i could text more to him yeah. i don't want to bother him um <laughs> because i had out of respect but he's uh but that was my number one like i gotta dive in and, and talk with this guy about certain things oh man you talk about getting the most out of your roster year in and year out he's the guy yeah he's we mentioned guy. we talked about all our connections with you you're the man We'll get the, the Pete Moylan LA stories for the next episode, I guess. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Please. Thank God.